Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I couldn't imagine a greater honor than presenting my first public speech as citizen Madonsela, than one in honor of Ahmed Kaprada, one of those who selflessly sacrificed their lives for us to have the life we, we dreamt of, but which looked unattainable at the time. It is an added honor that we celebrate this day on the 15th of October, the date on which the Rebonia trialists were released. I like the focus on what must rise, which is indicated by our, our program director is really about if peace must fall and many things must fall, what then must rise? The mention of the name Ahmed Katrada invokes images of the Rivonia trial and that it was quite it, it was quite heartwarming to see the video that was played a few minutes ago. As a child, I remember singing with others a song that said, Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela, there is no one like you. It was Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela, Ageko of Ananai. The song would proceed to then say, Walter Sisulu, Walter Sisulu, there's no one like you. Then Ahmed Kathrada, Ahmed Kathrada, there's no one like you. Mentioned all of them, Govan Peggy, Andrew Langley, and all of the other trialers. It was through this song and many others that we learned about the past. We learned about men and women classified under racial categories, under diverse racial categories, who decided that freedom, dignity, and equality for all was more important to them than pursuing their own lives. What did we learn from these lives? For me, what I've taken away from the life of Ahmed Kathrada and all of those people that gave up their lives for ours is a paradigm of service to humanity that is about beyond just us. Many of them could have done well in the system. Ahmed Kathrada was one of the educated ones and because of racial classification, <coughs> he belonged to the second most senior group in the country because it was whites, Indians, others, and Africans. <coughs> he, would, he could have done fairly well. Those who were white had no reason to be part of it, except they did feel that as long as there is injustice somewhere, there can't be sustainable peace anywhere. <coughs> From them, we learn a lesson of true selflessness. <coughs> Not selflessness on a poster to win an election, but true selflessness demonstrated by giving up what you have in order that you may give others what they don't have. We also learned from them human solidarity. The fact that in that house where they were, <coughs> Lily Sleep, and in all of the things that they did, they worked across color, across religion, and across <coughs> other trivial divisions that separate humanity. We also learned from them the, the value of compassion. 
Because what drove them? A sense that others were suffering. A sense that the dignity or the human dignity of others was eroded. I look at even the black people within that group. They were fairly middle class. Or at least most of them. Nelson Mandela could have pursued his legal career or any other career. He could have collaborated in the system and done well for himself. The same thing could have been done by Walter Cecilio. But they had compassion for fellow, for fellow human beings. And they had the courage to step out of their comfort zone so that they could use their skills and competences to help fellow human beings. Today we face a different situation. As we stand here in October 2016, there's many young people out there that are crying for fees to fall. Building on an earlier campaign which was called Roads Must Fall, but at the center of that campaign was Social Justice Must Fall. We are now confronted as a nation with making sure that we we'll listen, even if we don't want to listen, to cries for social justice. If indeed peace must fall, then what should rise? When I presented the strategic plan of the pop protector at the beginning of 2015, that is a meal, 20 months or so ago, I opened with a heart-wrenching story of a young university student whose human dignity had been undermined by maladministration. Despite gross indignity, he soldiered on in the quest for tertiary education. I mentioned how this resilient young man was called in front of his classmates and told to leave the university, which is a private university, and that he should come back when fees had been paid. The fees had not been paid by a municipality that was financing his studies, and he had explained this to the university. I mentioned to the MPs in that portfolio committee how this young person had approached us as the Pop Protector South Africa on a Friday, informing us, informing us that the following day, on a Saturday, his classmates were going to write a critical test, which test, if he was excluded from writing, he would fail the year and that if he failed that year, he would be excluded from the university the following year because that course for which he had to write a test was a course he was repeating. Despite protests from several MPs who argued that the story was irrelevant and a waste of time, I proceeded to talk about the lives of desperation lived by many students in public institutions. I spoke about students who were not able to register because either they didn't have money and they hadn't received a scholarship at all, or they were waiting for NSFAS to decide whether or not it was going to approve their application. And the registration was only 5,000 rand they would hang around universities unable to register. I spoke about students sleeping in libraries and bathrooms because they have no accommodation, and those who go without food for days because bursaries only cover fees and a limited number of expenses. I mentioned a campaign called I Am Jackson, initiated by students at the University of Pretoria 
in response to the plight of Jackson, a real person who was found by one of the students sleeping in a bathroom <coughs> in the library. I mentioned that there were many others like him, including those who would go for days without food and they were lucky to have a loaf of bread to, to use for the rest of the week. The MPs who thought this was a waste of time still thought so, despite having heard the full story. They continued with their efforts to force me to drop the narrative. Why did I tell that story as an icebreaker? I did so because I wanted to establish common ground. I had hoped that, though we may disagree on many things, but a call for service to fellow human beings in distress would unite us. I must say I was shocked to discover that I was wrong, that my assumption that we would find common ground on issues of human dignity, equality, and human solidarity was a wrong assumption. But I must indicate that the people who disagree with me were few, and they were from only one party. All of the other parties not only agreed with me, but pleaded with a few individuals from this other party to let me tell that story. They also disagreed that the story was irrelevant because it was a story about maladministration and how it causes despair and how it undermines trust in the system and forcing people to think about what the Chief Justice refers to as self-help. Because those of us entrusted with public power and resources won't listen. Why is the story relevant to a narrative of what must rise? It is relevant particularly on an occasion when we are here to celebrate the life and work of somebody who sacrificed his life so that others could have theirs. What they wanted to happen then, they wanted selfishness to fall. They wanted inequality to fall. They wanted human indignity to fall. What did they want in the place? They wanted Ubuntu. They wanted a nation that understands the notion of the interconnectedness of humanity. That when I hurt you, I will eventually hurt myself. That when I assist you, our collective fortunes will be improved. They wanted a state that was accountable, not a state that was insular, where those who exercise state power and control over public resources look after each other and look at state privileges as something to reward those that support them as opposed to state privileges and service delivery being part of entitlement for citizens purely because they're citizens and purely because they need those services. So, one of the things that must rise is the spirit that drove Ahmed Kathrada whom we call Uncle Kathy, to sacrifice his youth to the struggle. Do you know that he never got married before he went to prison? And he never got the chance to have any children. That's why he's, he's everyone's favorite uncle today, because he can only have children.
Thank you. Because he can only have children who call him uncle. But that's part of the spirit of Ubuntu. In Africa, it's said that it takes a village to raise a child. Think about that spirit that drove him to fight for everyone's human dignity. If that spirit rose, would we all be worrying about who's going to pay for the fees? Or we will be thinking, what can I do from my side? Even if all that I put into the pot is 10 red. What we call ourselves and what others call us does not matter. What matters is what we answer to through our actions and inactions. People talk about selflessness. We brand our organizations as selfless organizations. But do we look the other way when the dreams of the inclusive South Africa are shattered? Do we look the other way when among us we see the left behind? Those who know about the fruits of democracy but cannot concretely see the impact of those fruits of democracy in their own lives. Ubuntu is the foundational principle of our new constitutional democracy, and thank you to Uncle Kathy and all of those who fought for a society based on equality and human dignity. In S. vs. Makwanyani, Justice Yvonne Mokoro presenting a judgment of the Constitutional Court informed us that his, her understanding of the right to human dignity is that such right is based on the very notion of Ubuntu. I am because you are. Our fortunes are intertwined. And when I improve my fortunes, I only risk non-survival. But if I make sure that your fortunes are improved, we are all likely to survive. Are we still living according to those values? You be the judge. But because of what they struggled for, we have a constitutional vision. That constitutional vision is clearly stipulated in the preamble to our constitution. That preamble says, I quote, we, the people of South Africa, recognize the injustices of our past, honor those who suffered for justice and freedom in our land, respect those who have worked to build and develop our country, and believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. We therefore, through our freely elected representatives, adopt this constitution as the supreme law of the Republic, so as to heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. Lay the foundation for a democratic and open society in which government is based on the will of the people and every citizen is equally protected by law. Improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person and build a united and democratic South Africa able to take its rightful place as a sovereign state in the family of nations. I repeat these lines, which you may have heard several times, to remind us that that was the vision of society we signed up for, and that's a vision that has underpinned our journey in the last 22 years. And if we have to check why is the atheist must fall cry, we have to ask ourselves what must rise which fell in the process, hence people are now asking us that these must fall. As you've heard, 
the constitutional vision include a promise that everyone's potential will be freed and quality of life improved. What better way to free everyone's potential than to ensure that they have access to education to the fullest potential of being educated? What else? can we do to improve people's quality of life if we don't ensure that everyone lives a decent life where there's human dignity? There's no dignity in poverty. Personally, I was horrified that young people were sleeping in bathrooms. One of them came to stay with us at our house for a little while, and I asked her, how could you? I would have dropped out. How could you withstand that? She said, Mama, going back home was not an option. It's worse there than getting the education and hoping that my life is going to be improved once I have my degree. I'm glad that she has finally graduated and hopefully not only will her quality of life be improved, but through her, the quality of life of her family will improve, that of her community, and our quality of life in South Africa, Africa and the world will be improved because we invested in one young person. Our constitution entitles everyone to several human rights. One of them is the right to equality. In terms of the right to equality in Section 8, all humans are equal and none are more equal than others. This is the opposite notion to the paradigm of the animal farm in George Orwell. When writing, it says all animals are equal, but in reality, some are more equal than others. One of the promises is human dignity and another is social justice. And these were central because we were based in we were in a society that was based on legalized injustice, particularly legalized social injustice. What must rise then? Equality must rise, but how does it do so? Our constitution is only a bridge. By the stroke of the hand and trenching the right to equality in section nine of the constitution, we did not become equal. That is why our young heroine read that poem, or read, read that speech in school. That speech that she, she read was reminding us that there's still systemic inequalities, principally on the basis of race. And that those inequalities include the intersection of race and gender. They also include triple intersections, where some of our people are trapped at the bottom of society because of systemic inherited disparities on the grounds of race gender, and class. Now, if these don't fall, people who are trapped at the bottom of society because of persisting racial disparities compounded by gender discrimination and class inequality will be trapped at the bottom of society. But because the Constitution promises them improved quality of life and free potential, they can't suffer silently as other people did in the past. People ask, oh, some of us went to university and we paid back the money after we got bursaries. People say that. But it's not the same. If all we have to do is pay 
your bursary back. That's fine. But others, it's not just the bursary. They get a bursary, they get loans, then they have families to look after. It's not as if once you have an education, an uncle can give you a flat and say, we'll stay in this flat until you have a job. So the young ones are opening our eyes to the reality of continuing systemic disparities that undermine the constitutional dream, which is about non-racialism, non-sexism, etc. Are these persisting systemic disparities odd? Shouldn't they be there? Given the fact that we had apartheid for years, is it not natural that we should have these disparities? I hope you agree with me that we should have these disparities. 22 years is too short a time to eliminate disparities. But I also hope you agree with me that they shouldn't look the way they look like. I hope you agree with me that nobody should be sleeping in the toilet to get an education. When I told this story at the South African Law Reform Commission, one of the students who won a prize under the Isma Mohammed Prize said, I am one such person. I also slept in the corridor of the library to get my education. The sad thing is that not all of the young people are resilient. When some of them are first faced with these inhuman hardships, they bail out and go back to communities. <coughs> in fact, it's been said in the struggle now of these must fall forward, some of the students are not registered. Is it not possible that some of the ones who are not registered are those who suffered academic exclusions, which were instigated by financial exclusion? If we agree that these disparities shouldn't be there, even the cries against racism, the grossness of the reality of racism shouldn't be there, what really has gone wrong? Dear colleagues, my personal view, you can share it or not, is that we dropped Section 237 of the Constitution. How many of us base our decisions, Minister, on Section 237 of the Constitution? When you decide your policy priorities, when you decide what you're going to fund, when you decide you're going to bail out SAA and yet another state institution that is being run down by its own board, do you consider Section 237? When you say to the public potential, we don't have money to fund you, Yet, a week later, you have five billion to bail out SAA. Do you consider Section 237? Section 237 says constitutional responsibilities must be given priority and implemented diligently. Which means, whatever resources we have, Whatever policy possibilities we have, we have to do the things we must do first before we do the things we would love to do. <laughs> Dear colleagues, bridges must be crossed. We knew that the new South Africa needed us to traverse a journey in order to achieve it. The Constitution gave us a bridge. But when it comes to the issues of racism and eradicating systemic inequality, the Constitution knew that it alone is not enough and it made provisions for certain laws. One such law was the Equality Act. It was passed with such a rush to make sure that it was passed by February 2000.
because it was a constitutional requirement. Had we not met that date, we would have lost the opportunity to pass the Equality Act. We implemented the first part of it in such a rush. I remember at a, at a, non, at a racism conference where President Beggy had come to speak, I remember us running to his um, holding room to request him to sign that act because we thought it was important that we implement laws that are meant to change our lives. It was signed 2001 the anti-discrimination part of the act. But anti-discrimination presupposes that things are normal. Occasionally, we discriminate against each other. It's when discrimination is an aberration, but the norm is that people treat each other fairly. There was another chapter in that act, Chapter 5, which implements Section 9.2 of the Constitution. That is the part that required that we identify enduring disparities in terms of race, gender, and, dis and, and disability. In other words, we conduct an equality audit to look at what remains in terms of structural inequality and structural discrimination, and then prepare equality plans so that we proactively erode inequality and promote equality. Guess what? It's October 2016. The part that was a journey from one end of the bridge to the other end of the bridge remains unimplemented. Chapter 5 of the Equality Act remains unimplemented. So what must rise? The promises we, we make must be kept. Task teams, policies, <laughs> task teams, policies, strategic plans, and things like that don't change lives. They only provide us with roadmaps. The only way we can change lives is if we implement those things, and we implement them consciously and in a committed way, and we constantly evaluate if we're making a difference. Are we surprised, Uncle Kathy, that racism persists? I personally am not surprised. Because when we drafted that constitution, we included section 9.2 about proactive elimination of that which we inherited, which we don't want. Which meant we needed to act proactively to make a difference. 22 years of democracy, we've done nothing when it comes to the proactive part. The one part that we did prioritize is black economic empowerment. But in the way it's structured, it's such that the major beneficiaries are those of us who make these policies. Because of course we're part of those who have been elevated by the fruits of democracy. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, we, we live in a capitalist society and some of us are going to be a little bit more advantaged than others. But compare South Africa with Sweden where there's a conscious decision by the state to be egalitarian. There's a constant monitoring of every policy, every plan, the extent to which it will increase inequality or decrease inequality. Have we done that? Have we measured every policy that we conceived and considered whether it would decrease inequality, primarily on the grounds of race, gender, and disability? And when we implement, do we follow up to make sure it, it, it happens? For our part in the Power Protector South Africa, we've been writing and writing to the Department of Justice and asking, can we please implement Chapter, chapter 5 of the Equality Act? I invite you once more to say, can we please ask the Department of Justice to implement Chapter 5 of the Equality Act? We can pass as many laws about racism as we now want to pass, including those on hate speech. But if we're not going to implement those laws, they're not going to make a difference. Lastly, and related to what I've said, the architects of our democracy had a particular view on what the state should look like. They said it should be a state that is accountable. It is a state that operates with integrity and is responsive. 
And I think to a certain extent, we have become a state that is accountable, a state that is transparent, and a state that is responsive. But former President Nelson Mandela said, even the most benevolent of democracies have within them propensities for human things. And he then explained that that is why, because of that, they had created the architecture of our constitutional democracy to include institutions that hold government accountable, mentioning amongst those the public protector. We shouldn't then worry when public protector, Auditor General, Human Rights Commission finds some of those who exercise public power wanting. President Nelson Mandela said that happened to him, but he didn't see it as an irritation. He saw it as part of being assisted to achieve the constitutional dream. So what must rise? Submission to the notion of public accountability. Thank you. Related to that, what must rise is knowledge of the Constitution. If you are going to be the driver of a car, surely you must be the first to understand the car. So those who accept the privilege of being the few among us who are given the responsibility to take care of our collective power and resources must understand the Constitution because it's our only contract, it's our only pact that defines why that power should be used for whose benefit the power should be used, and how to account. And I've said this again, and I will say this for as long as I have an opportunity to say it. Accountability in the exercise of public power is not the same as accountability in the criminal justice system. If you're in a position of public power, it is an entrusted position. When things go wrong, being asked, do you know why things go, went wrong, is, it, is an issue that you have to answer. You have to be accountable. It's a different story in the criminal justice system because you can exclude people in the criminal justice system from your life, or at least you can try to exclude yourself. So accountability must, accountability must rise, <coughs> responsiveness must rise, and integrity must rise. In ending, we've done well in walking on the bridge to the society we chose to become. For that, we're grateful to Ahmed Kakrada, Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, Helen Joseph, Albertina Sisulu, Winnie Mandela, and all of them, too many to count. It is our time, though, to make sure that the precious South Africa they delivered into our heads is nurtured in line with the constitutional dream. And that is the dream of a South Africa that is inclusive, that is based on social justice, where everyone's potential is freed and everyone's life is improved. It is a South Africa that belongs to all of us. It is a South Africa where we don't fight white people we don't fight black people, we fight racism. And there's a difference. It is a South Africa that is based on human solidarity. It is a South Africa that says, as long as there is injustice somewhere, there can't be sustainable peace anywhere. And that's a South Africa that doesn't just look at peace in South Africa. It's a South Africa that is concerned about Boko Haram in Nigeria, that is concerned about injustice in, in the Middle East. It's a South Africa that is concerned about justice in Palestine, because as long as there's suffering there, 
as long as there's suffering and oppression anywhere, we can't be free. Our own peace is temporary and an illusion as long as there's injustice anything in the world. And talking about injustices in somewhere else in the world, the South Africa was signed to become is a South Africa that respects international law and it is a South Africa that is concerned about what's happening in other countries. It's a South Africa that is concerned that people who kill in the name of state power should be held accountable. But it is also a South Africa that is saying there are no holy cows, that global governance should start looking at what we often refer to as collateral damage. Where in the interest of enforcing democracy, people are killed, and it's called collateral damage. And in the end, those who are affected gravitate towards what we call terrorism. But we have to ask ourselves that when in the name of promoting democracy, we violate international humanitarian law, what are those who are affected by our own injustice supposed to do? Thank you, Uncle Kathy, for opening the dialogue on racism. Thank you, Uncle Kathy, for integrating though that dialogue in the general idea of social justice. And thank you for bringing us all here across color, reminding us that when you worked together, ending up in the Rivonia trial, you worked together across race, united by a vision of South Africa that you wanted to achieve. Where do we go from here? What should rise is dialogue. What should rise is money. Let's find some money from the state. Let's find some money from civil society. Let's create a supplementary fund. Even if there's an agreement, I know the public protector is facilitating a dialogue today with students with an attempt still to reach some kind of settlement. Ms. Louisa Zondo, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Power Protector, is having a second dialogue with people. But whatever that outcome may be, we're not going to be able to find adequate funds. That's why I'm saying the rest of us should find a way to contribute something. As a Power Protector South Africa, we pledged 15,000, then 5,000, which is 20,000. That amount has now risen to close to 700,000 from civil society. And two things must rise going forward. More people contributing. And secondly, a civil society organization that will collect those pledges. Because we didn't establish the fund, we pledged money. Somebody else has to establish a fund and manage that money. What else must rise? A culture of justice and not just us. <laughs> that culture is particularly important for those who exercise entrusted power, whether it is as public servants, public office bearers, or trustees in these communities such as Bab or Bamukhale and, and, and other villages. That culture of justice instead of justice is, is extremely important. But the culture of justice also means that when we see injustice, when we see suffering that doesn't affect us, we act. Because we understand that we are interconnected as human beings and that we are in the same boat. If there is a hole on the other side of the boat and there's none on my side, the difference is that those on the side of the boat where there's a hole will sink first, but will all sink eventually. What also must rise is remembering the past. Remembering what it took to bring us here. Remembering the sacrifices that people made. Remembering the promises we made. But more than anything else, 
remembering that we did say we're going to create a South Africa that belongs to all who live in it. And when we talk, therefore, we should never talk as if there are some who don't belong here. I trust that, like Uncle Kathy, who hasn't um, rested for a day since he came out of prison because the dream has not been achieved, that we'll all continue in our spaces, wherever we are, to play our part in the pursuit of the South African dream. Whether it's in solving some of the problems ourselves, or holding government accountable, or protecting whistleblowers, who tell us when things go wrong, we must just play our part. Thank you for this opportunity. Together we can ensure that the dream of an equal society where there's social justice and racism, sexism, and all other forms of discrimination is achieved. And to do so, the state has to be accountable, operate with integrity, and consistently become responsive. Thank you.